Southwestern family of companies welcomes you to the Action Catalyst. Each week, our diversely and amazingly accomplished guests share their insights and inspirations to help us ignite our own. So let's invest attention together to breathe, to reflect and refocus, and decisively defeat that voice we call Mr. Mediocrity. Then let's enjoy moving forward to make a positive difference in our world. Welcome back to the Action Catalyst. Today is a real privilege for me. I have the opportunity to sit across from Dave Ramsey. Dave is the CEO of Ramsey Solutions. And for people that are probably living on a foreign country or on another planet, you probably may not know everything about Dave, but anybody <laughs> in the U.S. probably does. Uh, Dave has helped literally millions of people. And Dave, I'm one of those people that you helped. Cool. I will always remember, even though you may not, having the chance to pick you up at the airport in Fort Walton Beach, Florida in the mid-90s. Oh, I do remember that. We were yeah. having a Southwestern Company sales we were, leader yeah. meeting, and you came and did a three-hour financial piece, even before that was a concept, seminar for all of us. I might have had a little hair then. I yeah. think I think we both had perhaps a little <laughs> bit more than we did at this time. Uh, but it was life-changing for me. It was for so many people. And I know you've had a big impact on Southwestern. You've known about our company, I guess, for quite some time. Absolutely. We're big Southwestern fans. And... Uh, you know, a lot of people in my age group, even in, in my peer group, are, are uh, alumni of Southwestern in one way or another. Have gone on to be very successful in other businesses, and so lots of my friends and um, and people that work on our team and everything else have Southwestern in their in their blood. Uh, I think that's awesome. Well, I'd love it if we could just start by having you share some of the major pivots in your career. I know that famously you were into real estate as a very young man and amassed a $4 million real estate portfolio by the age of 26. But then by the age of 30, it was all gone. What did you think about at that time? And what caused you to basically not give up, but instead to say, I've got to rethink the way I go about life. I've got to rethink the way I think about money. I've got to rethink a lot of things. Well, that was one of those uh, forced pivots. It was, uh, you know, went, we went broke. We lost everything because I was stupid. And I signed up for a bunch of debt and the bank called it. And, it, you know, it's we spent the next two and a half years of our life landing at the bottom at age 28 and um, bankrupt with a brand new baby and a toddler and a marriage hanging on by a thread. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a forced pivot. We, we, we had to stop and look. And, and I, don't, I, I didn't really bounce back. I sat around and blamed everybody else for my problems. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, when you do something stupid and you blame other people, it does, there's nothing that comes out of that it, it, that's positive. And so eventually I had to kind of come to my senses and a friend of mine called me out on it. He said, dude, you got so many lemons, you ought to make some lemonade out of this instead of sitting around whining about it. And so um, actually I was back doing real estate, just trying to eat, trying to feed the kids and I was scared to death. And I'm a young guy with a young family and I was, you know, losing my mind. And uh, so, uh, but I started teaching, I started learning first God's ways of handling money, biblical finance, which is common sense is really all it is. Uh, stay out of debt, live on a budget, live on less than you make. These are deep concepts. And we started applying them to our lives. And then I started teaching a little Sunday school class, had 20 people in it. And then, you know, before I knew it, there were 300 people in there uh, mm -hmm. wanting to know this information. So it turns out I'm not the only one that struggles with this issue of money and money mistakes and so forth. And so, you know, we started doing a little bit of uh, speaking and I went on a little radio station that was in Chapter 11 bankruptcy as a guest uh, that ended up taking over that slot and become working for free just for fun, mm -hmm. just to teach the stuff over the airwaves. And of course, that's all parlayed into a, a major national business now all these years later. Well, it started from the money game and mm -hmm. uh, possibly partly you thought it was kind of a game. Here you are broadcasting and something that had nothing to do with your past background in real estate. You've also created a whole way of thinking about building a business, which is entre leadership. And that combines the skills of entrepreneurship and the irrevocable fact that you've got to have leadership if you're going to build a business. First mm -hmm. lead yourself, then lead others. And you've had tens of thousands of people that have gone through that. Schools across the country are using your financial training materials for their children. To me, the best thing about that is it starts them very young with mm -hmm. the right foundation, the right ideas. Because if we raise up a child in the way they should go, then when they're adults, they will not depart from it. Amen. You and I share an acquaintanceship with the uh, late Larry Burkett. Oh, yeah. And Absolutely. He had all of those philosophies in such a brilliant place to go. What I'd love to do, Dave, is to hear more about how the Lampo Group has, which you started with. And by the way, listeners, Lampo means by the light of a torch. It's to bring enlightenment to people. And how that has grown from a card table in your living room to what is today such a world-changing business. 
and having a huge impact on people. So if you could maybe share how it grew from you leaving real estate into full-time working and helping people with, with their financial planning and financial attitudes. In other words, at what point did you say, well, real estate's how I kind of got here, but this is now my calling. In uh, 1994, I, we moved out of my living room and I was doing real estate and doing some coaching, financial coaching for money. And I was doing a little bit of speaking and I had a, you know, this idea that I might do a book someday. And I had written a little book and it was starting to sell a little bit. And uh, I was doing this radio show we talked about for free. And so I really wasn't making much money at the, at the financial thing, but God was tapping me on the shoulder going, the story that you have, because of what you went through, I'm going to use that story and we're going to redeem it. And um, we're going to show people what happens when you do it the right way after you do it the wrong way. Mm. And so we just kept teaching and trying to find different ways to get the message out. And so radio or a book or an event or coaching. And we start teaching a little class we called Life After Debt. We later changed the name of it to Financial Peace University. And um, hobbling all those little pieces of that business together, I think I was making about, I think we, Sharon and I sat down, we said, I think we can make $60,000 next year if we went full time on the financial piece and stop doing real estate. And so uh, I had made 120 the year before uh, doing real estate. This is after going broke. And so I was back up making, you know, six figures again. So we thought, well, we can, but we don't have any debt. We're, you know, we're in good shape. We can, we can take the pay cut in order to live the dream. And so sure enough, we, uh, we made 60,000 bucks. Right. <laughs> it wasn't as fun as it sounded. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you know, the next year we had hired a coach to help us and a, a receptionist and a little bit by little bit, each of those areas, the live events said, you know, that they would have 50 people come out when I was doing a seminar or something. And, um, you know, it's not unusual for us to have 10 or 12,000 now in an arena. And so gradually between those two figures, incrementally, everything began to grow little bit by little bit by little bit, never as fast as we wanted it to. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, but, but it's just the tortoise, the little, you know, the tortoise, the, the little train that could, you just keep going. You just keep hustle, grind, hustle, grind, hustle, grind, hustle, grind. Every year, incrementally, it was a little bit bigger. And, uh, you know, and you fast forward several decades, then here we sit. Right. And you've always had certain philosophies that have been consistent. One of them is paying cash for what you do. Right. Staying out of debt because right. that's what led you down the bad path in the first place. Exactly. And your work ethic. Uh, you are visible in the nonprofit work that you do. You're visible throughout your organization. And that work ethic is powerful. I read one of the quotes from your grandmother on the wall that said, when you're broke, there's a place to go. Go to work. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great place to go. Oh, I thought that was fantastic. You know, I've, there's very little, I, I guess from a sales background, I, I, uh, you know, the same kind of a, uh, a culture you guys have in that I grew up in the real estate business and th- there's nothing moves unless it's shoved. And so unless there's activity, uh, there's not going to be any positive results. Um, and, and so even if we're making a mistake, we're out there making it. And, and in a sense it's work ethic, but in a sense it's, uh, we got a lot of stuff to do. There's a lot of people need this help. Mm-hmm. And, and so there's a reason to get up and a reason to come down here every day. Mm-hmm. Well, you talk about passion and calling you know, to leadership. The passion is what gets you out of bed. The calling is what keeps you almost inexhaustible in terms of energy. And clearly you have that calling, Dave, making a difference in people's lives because if their financial stability is there, their peace is there, everything else works so much better. And the cause of divorces and family breakups and business failures through lack of financial discipline is, uh, is horrible. It's very real. It is. It didn't start out as a calling, though. I mean, it's evolved into that. It started out as almost entrepreneurial. I saw a need and I, I knew the need because Sharon and I had been broke and we knew what it felt like to be scared. And so we, we just saw a need and tried to fill it, try to help somebody else not feel that way, try to help somebody else get their credit card debt paid off, get rid of that student loan that's been around so long you think it's a pet. And we saw that, we saw that need, we saw that sense of, um, well, sim- simple entrepreneur, find a need and fill it, that kind of a thing. And, and, and then that worked. And then we had this huge, we would have these huge responses from the families that chose to transform their lives. Um, it's, it's inaccurate to say I've changed someone's life. I didn't. I just showed them how, made them believe they could, so they did it. That's all it was. And so, I mean, you know, how do you motivate people? You don't. You hire motivated people. And, and so um, the same situation here. I can't help someone that doesn't want to change what they're doing, that doesn't want to take some difficult steps, that doesn't want to 
uh, live like no one else so that later they can live and give like no one else. But I can show them how if they're willing to do it. And, and the, the, the response was so visceral uh, when these people changed their lives that it was so powerful that it evolved into a calling to where we went, wow, even if I didn't need money, I would go, keep doing this, which is where we are today. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, this, is a, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. And it hadn't got anything to do with the paycheck anymore. Long ago, that was all settled. Right. When people can finally realize what their true purpose is and that bolt of lightning that says, this is what I'm meant to do, it is a powerful moment. It's amazing. Now, you started by yourself doing these little seminars. You started with the church. How about as you scaled the business? What, what did you do mentally to decide it's time to add someone? and to figure out that process. Because many of our listeners are entrepreneurs themselves. Some of them are entrepreneurs that like to be. Some are growing businesses. How about, how do you you add people, and how do you let go and give that person the opportunity instead of personally doing it all? Well, I I ended up hiring people for two things. One is if they knew something I didn't know how to do, which there's a lot of that. (laughs) And, um, or if I just was all. You know, and so I couldn't do shipping, and so I got somebody to do shipping. I knew how to do it, but I got got too busy, right? I couldn't do the, uh, I could probably do the accounting, but I didn't want to anymore, and so I hired somebody to keep the books. And so, you know, we would find someone, something that needed to be done that either I knew how to do or I didn't know how to do that someone else could do so we could go on and do it. But I was dumb. I mean, when I first started, I was just, I was, I was so dumb. I thought if you hired people, they would work. (laughs) I thought if you hired people, they would care. You know, and they don't always, you know, and, and, and so I thought if you just, I got some work over here, here's some money, come do the work that it would just, that the people would come in and do it. But do no, it. all of a sudden it got complicated. Business is easy till people get involved. And so, you know, I, all of a sudden I realized, gosh, I'm look, I got like 10 people here and all I am is a boss. I'm not even a leader. I don't even know how to be a leader. Oh, I had management class. I'd read leadership books, but I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. And so I'm just telling people what to do. And then they weren't doing it. And I was shocked. Mm -hmm. Um, and so started really having to develop some leadership skills and, you know, absorb everything I could get my hands on reading and learning. And anybody that was seemed to be doing it right, I would ask them questions. And we, uh, over the years have, you know, uh, gone from being a boss to, being a world-class leader and the same with our leadership team here. We, you know, we don't have any bosses in this building. We've just got leaders, bosses push leaders pull. And so that's what, you know, we're in the business of setting the vision and putting the people in the right situations where they can make, execute and cause that vision to happen or removing them if they're not going to, mm-hmm. um, because we're going to get this done and this train's leaving. You should bother to be on it. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we, we've got a lot of stuff going on here. I mean, we're, we get people out of debt and I mean, it's not exactly a niche market. Mm-hmm. Me and Jenny Craig got a lot of work to do. You know I mean? There's, there's a lot of work to do. So if you're not going to come in here and be game on and care and bring all your skills every day um you know we're 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 real difficult to work for Mm -hmm. because we're all we all care deeply we're all excellent at what we do Uh, we make mistakes and we have a lot of fun and there's a lot of grace in the area but but we don't just sit around twiddle our thumbs and collect a paycheck around here we got stuff to do and i had to reset the tone of the whole organization early to that Mm -hmm. and um and, you know, I had some hound dogs working for me to sleep, go sleep under the porch, you know, and I uh, had to send them off and uh, get get some other folk. And it was set them free in Jesus name. But it, it just, um, you know, it's a process to build a team of thoroughbreds. And uh, when you wake up and realize you got donkeys in the stable, it's a problem. Mm-hmm. Well, those dogs under the porch wake up at the wrong moment and bite you in the rear end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do all that. Yeah. Uh, you use the phrase team members rather than employees. You speak about pulling rather than pushing. You speak about true leaders don't boss people. They serve people. Mm -hmm. Um, Share a little bit more on that one, that people aren't managed, they're served. I think that's a compelling quote. Well, first time I heard that a leader was a servant leader, the proper leadership was that. Was it a Christian thing? And um, I'm I'm a Christian, but I thought to myself, no, I'm not. I'm not a servant. I send their check. I tell them what to do. I'm out of their servant. But I started understanding servant doesn't mean subservient. Mm-hmm. Servant means that I've got their best interest at heart. I mean, when my kids are teenagers, I serve them by making them behave. I serve my eight-year-old son when he was eight by making him bathe. 
mm-hmm. <laughs> by making them go to school and get grades by uh, not letting the wrong kind of boy date my daughter. I'm, you know, and, and it's not always the person you're serving doesn't always enjoy being served. If you look no, at no, it that way, true. Uh, but I'm, but I have their best interest at heart. I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this because son, if you're eight years old, you don't learn to bathe. You're, you're going to have trouble in life. You're going to have to hygiene's a thing, you know? And so, and you, daughter, if you date this scallywag character, you're going to have a long life. It's not a good thing. The bad things are going to happen. And so, uh, and the same thing's true with our team. If you're not good at your job, you don't know how to do the job. You know, I'm not serving you by leaving you in the position. I'm serving you by setting you free. God's got something else for you to do because you suck at this. Mm-hmm. So he's got something else for you to do. So I start realizing that's what all servant means is I care about them as I care about the whole group, as I care about the mission of the place. And it's not, I, I'm not just trying to extract labor from the labor force. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we actually do all kinds of things for our team members. When, you know, grandma's ill, or we had one this year that her, just the other day, or her a special needs child passed away. I mean, oh my gosh, the whole place shut down. We're all in tears. And, but I mean, we love our folks, but, um, but you still got to get your job done because I'm not serving you by, by uh, sanctioning your incompetence. Mm-hmm. That's not serving you. That's just being uh, codependent. And codependence is not serving. And so I'm just going to love you into excellence. Uh, and, and maybe excellence is not working here. You can, you can go to heaven and not work here. Mm-hmm. I like that phrase. We're not sanctioning their incompetence. You know, help them realize that if they can't win here, there's someplace else maybe they're meant to win. Well, they, I'm sure. Uh, a different setting. Maybe they don't like my attitude, or maybe they don't like the, the way this place runs and guns. Because, and, I mean, we're gunslingers. We get her done, baby. You sure. know, and not everybody likes that environment. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. That's cool. If you want a more laid back, you know, art, artistic environment or something, then that, that's where you're going to flourish, then that's where you ought to be. Right. Well, hundreds of people feel like this is the place to go because you're consistently voted one of Nashville's best places to work. And that's an anonymous survey that goes to employees. So right. well done on that. Thank you. Making a difference. Uh, Dave, over the years, I know that you've hit some brick walls. Uh, every business builder does something that you can't see over it or around it. or You don't even know if you can even get through it. What's your mindset when you hit a business setback that you just don't have a clue? The problem solving steps you go through. And most importantly, your own self-talk when you hit something that you haven't hit before and you're not sure what to do about it. How do you guide yourself first? And then how do you guide the problem solving? Well, I mean... Uh, the more you do that, the easier it gets, because emotionally, as far, as far as controlling your own emotions, the first time you run into something like that, it's like you, you want to sit in the corner and suck your thumb and whine a lot. Uh, and But the more you overcome something you didn't think you could overcome, the more the next time something comes, even if it's a bigger thing, when it comes, you go, well, we did these other three things, you know, mm-hmm. so I know we can do this. I just don't know how yet. And so you start to build confidence on your ability to solve these problems and your team's ability to solve the problems. So um, the first thing I do when we run into something I don't know what to do is I gather our top minds in the building around that problem, and we sit and talk about it. The Bible says in the multitude of counsel, there is safety. Mm-hmm. And so um, it can be, it doesn't have to be a, a bunch of vice presidents or senior vice presidents or operating board members. It could be, I don't care who it is. It could be the, 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 uh, the maintenance guy. If he's got one of the answers, you know, so who's got the, who's got the data and who sees things in this particular space that we have a problem mm-hmm. and, and let's all sit and talk that through. And, um, you know, let's decide how we're going to react to this. Mm-hmm. Um, it could be an adversarial thing where somebody's coming at us. And uh, we go, okay, do we punch? Do we dodge? You know, how are we going to react to this adversarial thing? Uh, what's the, you know, what's the proper thing? What's the right spirit to approach it with? And what's the end game we want? And we just sit and talk. And, and it's amazing then uh, if that group of people will do the second thing. And that's we need to create several options mm-hmm. of how to deal with this issue. Options are power. They give you uh, confidence because you say, well, if that one doesn't work, then we can do this one. And if this one doesn't work, we can do this one. And our worst case scenario is that one, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and so you can kind of lay them out pretty quick, and the critical thinking skills will stack them for you. And you go, well, that's what we hope happens. 
Mm-hmm. But then if it doesn't, then this is what we could do. And you build, you kind of flow chart it out, so to speak, and uh, you create a decision tree and, and know where you're going. And you don't have to draw it out, but I mean, you, everyone kind of says, okay, these are the three things and they're in this order that we're, how we're going to respond or how we're going to try to tackle this or, or what we're doing or, or something. Um, and sometimes it means that we have to staff it. Sometimes it means we have to, uh, we have to get resources or we have to wait. We're gonna, you know, that not doing something is a possible decision. Sure. Uh, you know, I'm waiting. I'm, I'm not, we're not ready to answer this yet. We're not ready to get there yet. But after we did these three or four things, maybe we could see over the edge of the wall. Mm-hmm. And, um, and at least we can get our vision where we can see it. Right. And so uh, gathering the right minds in the room, sometimes they're from outside. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's outside expertise. But uh, depending on the type of problem it is, but if it's a business acumen thing, generally we've got the minds in the building to pull it off. We've just got to talk it through, and someone will have that Holy Spirit moment, and God will whisper to them and tell us what to do. Mm-hmm. You've uh, shared some things about your mindset just now that I think are really inspiring to me and also to our listeners. First, when you're faced with this brick wall, you say, I haven't faced this one before, but we've faced others. We found a way to get through it. So first, it triggers hope, it triggers that belief. Second, I love the phrase you just said, I don't know how to do this. We just don't know how yet. We don't know what to do, but that's just a matter of learning. So let's get our team together. And many strong leaders try to be the only one that makes decisions. Your willingness to pull your team in on that is also a characteristic of your leadership style. Well, I've made bad decisions when I didn't do that. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, because I, I get pretty fired up, man. I, I'm gonna go fight first. That's my first inclination, and that's not always the answer, obviously. Mm-hmm. And so, as we've gotten larger and more sophisticated, and have more resources and more power in the marketplace, we have to be careful and gentle with that power, uh, and decide if we're gonna if we're gonna if we're gonna fight. We need to be very very careful about when we're gonna do that. Right. It's like the young man that asked the old philosopher, so how do you make good decisions? And he said, wisdom. And then he said, well, how do you get wisdom? He said, bad decisions. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> that definitely can do that. Um, Dave, some people at your position in the world um, decide to coast. They just say, you know, we've done pretty well. Things are in good shape. We're well known. We're achieving our mission. We've got a motivated team. Things are humming. I think it might be okay to take just a little breather. How do you, how do you fight that ten? that some people have to listen to the voice we call Mr. Mediocrity. Mm. Well, I, I guess it's just, um, I think usually when that sneaks up, it's because you're not having fun. Mm. And I'm still having fun. Uh, we laughingly say around here, um, like about the radio show, I tell the radio guys that are producing the show, you guys better hope I continue to enjoy this because the day I quit enjoying it's the day we quit doing it. <laughs> so, you know, as long as I'm having fun. But, I mean, you, we've all listened to shows that somebody's not having fun, and you can tell it on the other end of the microphone. So they should have quit. They should have they stopped. Right. And, uh, you know, when do you, when do you move to the next chapter or the next, uh, the next thing you've got to do? And uh, when it ceases to be fun. And I do that pretty regularly. I change things, uh, what I personally get involved in. Number one, I'll just hire somebody else to do it if I don't like it. I'm tired of doing it. You're going to do this now. And um, and it gives them an opportunity to have fun doing that. And I, and it became, had become drudgery for me. Um, or we just stop doing it around here, mm-hmm. you know? That's great. Dave, a question. How do you balance it all? You're involved with nonprofits. You're involved with work that nobody even knows about that helps people. You're involved in growing Ramsey Solutions. How do you keep track of that? How do you keep the balance going? Well, I, I think balance is a um, is mythology. I don't think anybody's balanced that wins at anything. The trick is that over the scope of time to have some balance. But in a given block of time, in a given 90-day period, you might not be in balance. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're training to run a half marathon, you're going to spend a lot of time on the road or training to run a marathon. You're going to spend a lot of time out there hoofing. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're launching a business, when I was launching this thing, man, it was 16 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, we were busting it and it wasn't in, I wasn't in balance, you know, but, but Sharon and I are looking at it and saying, this is what God's saying to do. And so, yeah, you know, we're not going to be as attentive to our marriage. I might miss a soccer game. You know, a four-year-old kicking a ball down the thing, you know, I I didn't miss them all, but I I did miss some Mm -hmm. because I was out of balance. But then later on, I can, you know, work like no one else. Now I can work like no one else. I do whatever I want to do now. Mm -hmm. And so, um, 
Uh, but but over time, if all you do is show up for every single thing for your children and every single thing for your marriage, you're probably going to starve to death. Mm-hmm. And, and on the other hand, if all you do is work, uh, you get home one night, none of them are going to be there. Yeah, they're going to have left. Yep. And so you you know you have to over time balance it out. But it ebbs and flows. The tide comes in, the tide goes out. The moon's full once a month, and so there's a time that that you have a uh, you know, an intense uh, walk with God. And then there's other times that it's a little more subtle mm-hmm. and then it's intense again. And then it's more subtle again. The same thing with taking care of your body. If I, I've got friends that all they do is work out mm-hmm. and their career is suffering mm-hmm. because they're out of balance over a long scope of time. But if you don't take care of your body as a part of the rhythm of your life, you know, your career is going to suffer because you're going to end up in the hospital all the time. Yeah, absolutely true. It's a misnomer that balance means equal portions of priorities with equal portions of time. I think if you try to touch every base every day, you'd go bananas. You would. Too many bases, not yeah. enough legs. Very true. And Solomon put it best when he said, there's a time for every purpose mm. under heaven. For everything, there's a season. I think that's awesome. Dave, what do you do consciously about managing your own self-talk? You know, self-talk is something that everybody's got. Nobody can avoid it. Over the years, you must have had times when your thoughts went in the wrong directions and you learned how to rein them back in. What can you share with our listeners about that inner dialogue and how to keep that moving in the right direction? I grew up with a silver spoon in my mouth, in the sen- not in the sense that we were rich. We weren't rich. Uh, but mom and daddy were in the real estate business. And so as young people, they plugged into uh, some of the same wonderful speakers and thought leaders that you guys plug into at, at Southwestern. And, and so, I mean, I'm 10, 12 years old and sitting in Dale Carnegie class, mm. I'm reading how to win friends and uh, influence people. I'm uh, with my dad, you know, I, I, he would take me to these sales events and hear Earl Nightingale and Zig Ziglar and, um, you know, Paul Harvey and, uh, you know, reading Napoleon Hill. And, and so I, I, that stuff was ingrained into me in my uh, early adulthood and teenage years to the point that uh, that I'm that I'm pretty much a weirdo on that stuff. And it and I think it has affected my quote self talk unquote. Um, you know, it really made me believe not unreasonably and not illogically, but I really believe you can do almost anything if you're willing to pay the price and take the time. I mean, if you're willing to lay it out there now, not I, almost anything. I mean, within reason, I'm not going to, I have no desire to be the president of the United States, zero. Mm-hmm. And I probably couldn't be if I wanted to be, you know? So I, I don't, that's an unreasonable thing, but I, I think we can grow this business to double. I can see that and triple. And so now I probably got to know some things I don't know today and do some things I don't do today. And some of the people around here too, to get there, otherwise we'd already be there, mm-hmm. but, but, uh, but it's doable and reachable and you know, that, that kind of a faith element. And of course my, my walk with God, the, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Mm-hmm. I really do believe my heavenly father's crazy about me. He's got a plan for me. It's not to bring me harm, but to bring me hope. And, um, does that mean I don't bump my toe or, or fall down and, you know, do stupid stuff? Oh, of course I do. Mm-hmm. Of course I do. It doesn't mean any of that, but, but there's this idea that yeah, this too, we'll get there. We can do it. This too shall pass. We'll get there. Mm -hmm. That optimism that's based upon faith, that's based on the foundation of work ethic, it's based on the right principles. It's just, and it's a decision. Yeah. Just look at the glass and say, okay, is this glass half full or not? Mm -hmm. Make that decision and then act accordingly. Yeah. I just never met anybody that sat around and whined and believed negative things that got anything done. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, we've all done some of that. It just doesn't get you anywhere. It, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't cause me to. It doesn't take me where I want to go, and so I'm not going to do it. It's a, it's it's an act of will. Right. Absolutely. Um, Dave, your organization today is continuing to grow. They're far flung. They're diverse geographically. They're spread into different business niches. What are some things you do to keep the philosophies in alignment and the beliefs in alignment with this large group of people in different places doing different things? Uh, we spend an amazing amount of money and time on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, we share success stories and we share problems and we, uh, you know, we do recognition uh, and we reiterate a core value and, uh, and, and talk about that. And, and you know, and, and then we, re- we enforce them. You're, you're going to be these core values because that's who we are. Mm-hmm. And if you're not these core values, you're not a we. 
And so this is who we are. This is who it, you know, this is how we think. How, and, and if you want to be here, this is who we are. You don't have to be here, but if you want to be here, this is who we are. Mm-hmm. And and if somebody isn't that, we move them out. And uh, and the ones that are, we lift them up. And so people see that and they go, okay, this is real. This is not just a brochure filler. These aren't just things we put on the wall. This is how we act, how we think, who we who we uh, how we see ourselves. And uh, and so. Uh, we're going to care deeply about that. And so communication of that and, and enforcement, so to speak, of it, that's probably a strong word, but but uh, the integrity would say that we need to align our actions with what we say our values are. Right. And so when we don't move somebody out who doesn't run those values, then that's a lack of integrity, mm-hmm. uh, organizational integrity. And, and so we have to do that. And, and then everybody goes, oh, this is real. They're not kidding, you know, and, um, you know, uh, and, and then and we started off with their onboarding at the end of their onboarding at the first 90 days is when you become official because you've decided to stay during that probation period. And we decide to keep you during that probation period, which is 99 percent of the time what happens. And I do a thing with all the new team members at the 90 day mark. We uh, wrap with Dave. We bring in uh, Chick-fil-A wraps and sit around and talk mm. and I answer questions for him. And I uh, always ask them, you know, what have you discovered about this place since you first got here? What's your aha moment? Mm-hmm. And a lot of times it's they're a little shocked that we are actually who we say we are, that the audio meets the video. Yeah. You know, and, and it's like we, one of our core values is no gossip. We'll fire you for gossiping. And nobody believes that until they work here mm-hmm. because we'll fire you for gossiping. Mm-hmm. I mean, we will. We're not going to have it. We, this filth is trash. It's nastiness. We got stuff to do. It's too hard to work together when you can't trust people. Everything moves at the speed of trust. So we enforce the crap out of that, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, it burns my butt up when people run around talking about people. We got, you know, you got a problem. You hand the negative to your leader. That's not gossip. But when you sit around and talk to everybody else that can't do anything about it, that's just spreading trash and filth through the place. Well, Toxicity. And so they're always like, I, I, I heard it. I, I hoped it was true, but I've never worked in a place that acted this way. Mm. And no one in here gossips, and we all like each other, and I work with smart, happy people, and it's weird because no <laughs> other place I've worked is that way. And that's that's what they always tell me in these 90 days thing. The second thing I do in that 90-day thing is I remind them that this whole place will disintegrate and become one of those other places if they are consumers of culture rather than producers of it. And so you're now French as of that 90-day. You're wee wee. Mm-hmm. It's not that it's not us and them. You're one of us. And so you are a member of the team. And that's not uh, just semantics. You really are a member of the team. So you're really uh, if you don't if you like this place, you need to reproduce the things that you like here mm-hmm. uh, about it. And so help us uh Help us, you know, do the things that make you glad you're here. You work with a bunch of happy people, so be happy people. You know, you want you want to work with a bunch of smart people, so be smart people. You want to work with people that care, so care. You know, and you got to be producers of culture because I can't dictate one guy over 800. There's not a chance I can dictate culture. You mm-hmm. can't. It, it's created. It's a reflection of who the people are in the building and what they believe. Right. And that's the Lampo happening over and over. Yep. With all of your people. I think that's phenomenal, Dave. It, it's all about realizing when you're on the team you're fully on the team you've talked a lot about people that complain laterally are so toxic in an organization and so you've eliminated that it also shows what the definition of values really is it's not a value unless we act according to it otherwise it's just a platitude or a statement or a thought it's a wish yeah it's a this looks nice on a plaque yeah but when we act according to it then it truly is a value that's great dave ramsey is somebody that i look forward to continuing to learn from as i've been blessed to do for a long period of time and hope you've enjoyed the time with him as much as I have. So until next time, this is Dan Moore. Thank you for joining the Action Catalyst. If you enjoy this podcast, please make sure to subscribe. To stay updated on everything that the Action Catalyst is up to, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Action Catalyst Podcast and Twitter at Catalyst underscore Action. Thanks for listening.